Well, now we want to continue our study about the importance of the historical flow method, known also as historicism. Uh, let's just review briefly what uh, futurism does with historicism. First of all, if Revelation 4 through 19 takes place in the future after the rapture of the church, none of it is relevant for us today. So what does that do with the three angels' messages? It makes them irrelevant for today. Secondly, futurism has the timing of the rise of the Antichrist wrong. We believe that Antichrist already arose within the flow of, of Christian history. Futurism teaches, no, the Antichrist will arise in the future over the Middle East. And so basically, if the Antichrist is going to rise in the future, he has not risen in the course of church history. In the third place, futurism is wrong about the place where the Antichrist will appear. They say that the Antichrist will appear in the Middle East. We say that the Antichrist appears in Rome. In the fourth place, futurism has wrong the manner in which the Antichrist will appear. According to futurism, it will be a blasphemous individual who will blaspheme God and Christianity. We believe that it is a power that will arise within the Christian church and counterfeit the work of Christ. Next, futurism gets the parties involved in the controversy wrong, because we believe that the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are the parties involved on one side, and the wicked are on the other side, and the issues have to do with worship. Futurism teaches, no, 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 the parties involved are the Arabs who have allied themselves perhaps with the Russians and with others, the Chinese, that come and attack the Jews. So in other words, the parties are shifted from Rome and Protestantism in the United States to the Middle East. Also we notice that futurism has the issues in the controversy wrong. We believe that uh, the issues are the law, the Sabbath, and worship. Futurism teaches no, no, it's the oil of the Middle East and it is anti-Semitism. We also notice that futurism obliterates the timing for the, the rise of the remnant church, because Revelation chapter 12 tells us exactly when, where, and what characteristics the remnant church will have. Futurism says no, Revelation 12 is future, it has nothing to do with the Seventh-day Adventist church. We also notice that futurism destroys the prophecy of the 2300 days, and it destroys historicism, or the historical flow method, as the method to properly interpret Bible prophecy. Now the next point that I would like to deal with is that futurism gives people a false sense of security. You see what futurism teaches is that if you don't make it in the rapture then you can still make it during the tribulation. And if you don't make it through the tribulation then there's still the opportunity if you survive the coming of Christ to be converted during the millennium. And so basically it's a doctrine that teaches several chances for you to embrace Christ and to reach salvation. Whereas scripture teaches that before uh, the second coming of Christ, when probation closes, at that moment probation closes for everyone and there is no further probation. You see as Adventists we believe that we are to prepare not so much for the second coming, we are to prepare for the close of probation. And when probation closes, that's it. There are no more chances. There are no chances after a rapture, more chances during the millennium. No. Once a person dies, that's the close of probation, individually. Or if the world reaches its moment of the corporate close of probation, that's it. There are no more chances after that. And so the devil wants people to think that they're going to have multiple chances to give themselves to the Lord and to be saved. The next point that I would like to deal with is that futurism causes people to not prepare for the time of trouble that is going to come upon the world. The time of trouble that is going to come upon the world is the worst in the history of planet earth. It is going to be a tremendously trying period of time. 
and we are going to need an unshakable and unbreakable faith to go through the tribulation, because our faith will be severely tested. But what does futurism teach? They say, no, no, you don't have to worry about going through the tribulation, that's for the Jews, that's not for Christians, you know, you're going to be whisked off to heaven, and the tribulation is going to be for those who are left behind. So you can have your cake now, and you can eat it too. In other words, people are not uh, invited to prepare for something that they don't believe that they're going to go through. Let me ask you, would you prepare for a hurricane in Fresno? I wouldn't. There's no hurricanes in Fresno. Would you prepare for a tsunami in Fresno? No, you wouldn't prepare. Why not? Because you say, there's not going to be a tsunami in Fresno, there's not going to be a hurricane in Fresno, because you don't believe that it's coming. So you don't prepare for what you don't believe is coming. Futurists don't believe that they're going to go through the tribulation, and so when probation closes and the tribulation begins, they'll be in the midst of the tribulation without any shelter whatsoever, because they have not prepared. Let me read you some statements from the Spirit of Prophecy on this specific point. The first statement is in Great Controversy, page 594. Ellen White um, says in this particular statement, Before His crucifixion, the Savior explained to His disciples that He was to be put to death and to rise again from the tomb, and angels were present to impress His words on minds and hearts. Notice, angels were there. But the disciples were looking for temporal deliverance. Did they misinterpret Bible prophecy? Did it make a difference? Oh yeah, they were wrong about the way in which prophecy was going to be fulfilled. Of course that wouldn't happen in connection with the second coming, right? <laughs> she continues saying, but the disciples were looking for temporal deliverance from the Roman yoke, and they could not tolerate the thought that he, in whom all their hopes centered, should suffer an ignominious death. The words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds. Who do you suppose banished them from their minds? The devil. And when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. The death of Jesus has fully destroyed their hopes as if he had not forewarned them. And now comes the application. So, like it was back then, she says, So, in the prophecies of the future is opened before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation, and the time of trouble will find them unready. If you're thinking that prophecy is going to be fulfilled in the future, after you've been whisked off to heaven, would you think that would be necessary to prepare for the worst time of trouble in the history of the world? Absolutely not. The devil wants to lull people to sleep. Notice this next statement, Great Controversy, page 622. Isn't that true that we usually think that things are going to be really bad and uh, and, and we try to imagine the worst case scenario? Well, Ellen White says that we can imagine the worst case scenario for the tribulation and it's still going to be worse. Notice this next statement. The time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent to obtain. Indolent means lazy. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In that time of trial every soul must stand for himself before God. So you can imagine the worst, and it's still going to be worse than what you can imagine. That's what the time of trouble is going to be like. Great Controversy 621, she says, The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger, a faith that will not faint, though severely tried. The period of probation is granted to all 
to prepare for that time. Now does what Ellen White say square with scripture? Absolutely. Let's notice a couple of texts. Matthew 24 verses 21 and 22. Matthew 24, 21 and 22. Jesus says here, For then there will be great tribulation, such, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Does that sound pretty drastic? And listen, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. It's going to be so severe that God is going to have to shorten it or else nobody would remain alive. That's how bad it is. And then we find in Daniel 12 verse 1, similar words, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, at that time Michael shall stand up. That's the close of probation when Michael stands up. It's Jesus changes his garments from priestly garments to his kingly garments. At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Once again, the emphasis, it's the worst time of trouble in human history. But here's the good news, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. You know we have an illustration of this in the historical sections of Daniel. One of the materials you're going to receive is that each of the stories of Daniel is a prophecy. Not only are the prophecies of Daniel, like Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, prophecies, but the stories in Daniel are also prophecies. The three young men in the valley of Dura, see? Nebuchadnezzar for a while lived like a beast, didn't he? And he raised up an image. He commanded everyone to worship his image, and whoever did not worship would be killed. Does that sound familiar? Revelation 13, the beast raises an image. He commands everyone to worship the image of the beast, and whoever doesn't will be what? Will be killed. And so you know that there's a relationship between the story in the Old Testament and the story at the end of time. Only at the end of time you're dealing with a global event. You're not dealing with a local thing that's happening in the valley of Dura. The experience of the three young men is an illustration of what the time of trouble is going to be like. What would you do if there was a burning fiery furnace that was heated to the maximum heat, that's what the number seven means, I don't think that Nebuchadnezzar had a thermometer, but uh, imagine a furnace, a kiln, heated to its maximum heat, and they say to you, you either receive the mark of the beast or we're going to throw you in there. Would that be a test of faith? That would be a huge test of faith, and Ellen White explains that the furnace that the young man went through represents the furnace of affliction of the time of trouble. She says in the chapter in Great Controversy on the time of trouble, she says the flames will appear at the point of consuming God's people, but they will come forth as pure gold. That's what she says. So the furnace is symbolic of the time of trouble. The number seven represents the worst, totality, complete. In other words, it will be a terrible time of trouble, and those who have not prepared will be found wanting. So what does futurism do? It says don't worry about preparing for the tribulation, you know just enrich yourself, get lots of houses and lots of money, this prosperity gospel, just prosper and you know you can have your cake here and then God is going to take you to and continue enjoying bliss in heaven forever. And so people are lulled to sleep, they say oh no it's going to be easy, Christianity is an easy thing, and they don't realize that when probation closes the time of trouble will come and they will be totally unprepared. Futurism lulls people to sleep, gives them a false sense of security because they think they can be saved beyond the moment of the rapture and also no preparation for the time of trouble such as never has been seen. Another very important point is that futurism sets itself up for the counterfeit second coming of Christ. Now futurism is based on two large errors. Number one, a wrong comprehension of the prophecy of the 70 weeks. We've already discussed that, a gap between week 69 and week 70 which skews Bible prophecy and uh, you know basically it eliminates uh, the 2300 day prophecy and its fulfillment in 1844. 
but there's another pillar of futurism and it's a, it's a pillar that's built on sand and that is that the millennium will be spent on earth. In fact all of futurism is based on a wrong concept of the millennium. Now let me explain how this is. Jesus made two promises to his people. The first promise is in John 14 verses 1 to 3 and you have this in your material if you're following along. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Where was Jesus going to go? To heaven. He talked about his Father's house. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. By the way, Jesus, Jesus did not go to heaven to build mansions. Jesus did not say, in my Father's house will be many mansions, he says, in my Father's are many mansions. They were there when he said it. Jesus does not need 2,000 years to do heavenly contracting. <laughs> when he created the world in six days. There's something far deeper here. And so he continues saying in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, and we usually emphasize that he's planting flowers and making everything beautiful up there. Jesus doesn't need 2,000 years to make the heavens beautiful. So you say, what does it mean? He goes to prepare a place for us. It simply means that he prepares the place for us by the work that he performs in the heavenly sanctuary. That's where the book of Hebrews comes in and the book of Revelation. It's by his work in the holy and most holy place that he's able to prepare a place for us. And we've missed that because we focus on, on uh, you know, planting flowers and you know, making the place beautiful for us. I'm sure he's going to make it very beautiful, even more beautiful than Eden. And I'm sure he's going to have mansions for us. But there's something far deeper than that involved here. And so in verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Did Jesus promise to take his people to heaven, yes or no? Amen. Yes, he did. But he made another promise. It's found in the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So Jesus promised his people to take them to heaven, but he also promised them that they would inherit the earth. Now how can Jesus fulfill both of those promises? Futurists say that there's only one way that it can happen. They say, listen, what happens is, seven years before his glorious coming, Jesus raptures his people to heaven, and they spend seven years in heaven. That fulfills the first promise. He takes them to the Father's house for, a thousand, for seven years. And then after seven years in heaven, he comes back with them, and then the meek inherit the earth, because the thousand years will be spent here. So their view is based on the millennium. If you believe that the millennium is going to be on earth, they say, then you have to believe in a rapture where Jesus is going to take his people to heaven for seven years, because if he doesn't, then he will not have fulfilled the promise that he was going to take his people to his father's house. Are you following me or not? But I believe that there's another, the Adventist way, for Jesus to fulfill both of those promises. And that is that Jesus is going to come in his second coming, gloriously in only one coming. And he's going to take his people to heaven for a thousand years, that fulfills the first promise, and then he's going to bring them to the earth, and the meek will inherit the earth. You do not have to invent a rapture idea to believe that Jesus is going to take his people to heaven, and then you're going to have the new earth. If you have the correct view of the millennium, you will understand that the first promise of the Father's house takes place when Jesus comes again and takes his people to heaven for a thousand years. The second promise is after the thousand years when he comes back and then the meek will inherit the earth. So their wrong view of the millennium is what causes them to invent the pre-tribulation rapture because there has to be some time when Jesus is going to take his people to heaven. Are you understanding me? Now, those individuals who believe that Jesus is going to spend the millennium here on earth are setting themselves up for a huge deception. Because the devil is going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ. And he's going to make it appear that the millennium has arrived. And if you're expecting the millennium to be on earth, you will be deceived. Praise the Lord that God's people will not be deceived. It says in Matthew, he will deceive, if possible, the very elect. 
it's the elect that are the target of the devil's deceptions. He won't be able to deceive the elect. If it were possible, that's very hypothetical, if it were possible he would deceive the very elect. God's elect will not be deceived, but it will be the intention of the devil to deceive them. You see, the devil will see that there's a group of people that are faithful to God. And he's going to say as a last resort, I've got to do something to get these people to my side. I haven't been able to, you know, through persecution, through a death decree, I have not been able to get them over to my side. And so he says, I know what I'll do. What I will do is I'll counterfeit the second coming of Christ, and they'll think that it's the real Christ, and they'll accept me. Are you following me or not? But God's people won't be deceived. Allow me to read you Matthew 24, 26, and 27, and then the description that Ellen White gives of the counterfeit second coming. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is on CNN. No, that's not what it says. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Hey, if he's on television, don't even look, because it's going to be dazzling. And then Jesus said, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It will be visible to the whole world. The Christ will not appear in different parts of planet Earth. Now let me read you Ellen White's description. This is found in the book Great Controversy, pages 624 and 625. She says, As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that's important, will make it appear that Christ has come. In different, here comes the key, in different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. Is the devil going to be able to counterfeit how Jesus looks? Oh yeah. His face is going to shine as the sun. His legs are going to be like burnished bronze. He's going to be clothed in a white garment. People are going to say, this is the Christ of Revelation chapter 1. It's what we've been waiting for. Notice what she continues saying. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them, as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. Don't you think he's going to say, I am the Christ! <laughs> no. <laughs> no! His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. Now listen, in gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He can utter the truth even. But not the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Notice what else. He heals the diseases of the people. And then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. And then Ellen White says this is the strong almost overmastering delusion. In fact she has another statement where she states that God's people will be crying out in anguish for deliverance in the time of trouble and that's when Satan is going to counterfeit the second coming. He's going to say I have come to answer your pleas. Wow. That's why it's a strong, almost overmastering delusion. Now, will God's people be deceived? Will the elect be deceived? No, why not? Because they don't go by their eyes. They don't go by their ears. They don't go by their feelings. They go by what God says. Notice what she continues saying. But the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. What is the key? 
the scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. And now notice, and furthermore, Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. The Savior has warned his people against the deception upon this point, and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. Is it important to know how he will come? Of course it is. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Wherefore, if they should say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This coming there is no possibility of counterfeiting, it will be universally known, witnessed by the whole world. What will unmask the devil? The scriptures folks, that's what the only thing that we can build our faith on is God's holy word. If you don't know how he will come, you will end up accepting the wrong who. You see we live in a postmodern world where people are driven by experienced theology. Truth they say comes from inside, not from outside. Truth is subjective, not objective. Truth is personal, not biblical. The importance of doctrine is downplayed. You notice that on the Tony Palmer video. He says, That's for, you know, we'll sort out our doctrines when we get up there. Well, if you don't sort them out here, you won't be there. <laughs> That's the bottom line. But people say the, the doctrine isn't important. Let's just love one another. Let's just come into unity. Let's get along. It's an artificial unity. And by the way, he quoted the text where Jesus says that he, that he wanted us all to be one, but he also forgot to quote the text that says, sanctify them in their, your truth. Your word is truth. See, that's called selective quote, uh, quoting. The devil is going to use the same method that he used with Eve. Do you know what the devil did with Eve? He led her to follow the testimony of her heart. Everything the devil did was, was based on the subjective. First of all, here's a snake that's talking, a serpent that's talking. Do serpents talk? Well, that would be a miracle, right? So he performs a counterfeit miracle. And then he misquotes the word of God. And then he says to Eve, hey Eve, you know, you want to know the real reason why God told you not to eat from the tree? He told you you were going to die, but that's not the reason. And so Eve is saying, well, tell me what the reason is. And he says, God knows that if you eat from the tree, you're going to be like him, and God doesn't want any rivals. He's the only one who wants to be God. So he's intimidated everybody to think that they'll die if they eat from the tree, but the real reason is that everybody's going to be like him. And so Eve says, yeah, God didn't explain why we couldn't eat from the tree. Now I have an explanation. The devil is playing mind games. And then it says she sees the fruit. It looks good. She's touching it because the, the serpent placed it in her hand and she didn't die. And she had said that God had said if you touch it you'll die. She added to the word of God. It's dangerous to add to the word of God. And so she's, she's seen the fruit. It looks good. She thinks that it'll be tasty. She's hearing what the devil is saying, so now she takes the fruit and she eats. Her standard of deciding what to do was based on experience. Her only protection was to say, we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Our only protection, Ellen White has a chapter in Great Controversy, our only safeguard will be to build our faith upon the Word of God as it is written. Now let's assume for a moment, bear with me on this, that the futurist scenario that I have described at the beginning of our study will unfold just like futurists have said. One day many people all over the world disappear into thin air. A ten nation federation is established in Europe led by a charismatic individual who signs a seven year peace treaty with the Jews. During the first three and a half years of his reign, things begin to deteriorate. 
but during the last three and a half years the planet unravels at the seams. There are unparalleled natural disasters, devastating pandemics, warfare, social unrest, famines and criminality such as never has been seen in the history of the world. As the Antichrist increases in power this individual receives a deadly wound, but miraculously his deadly wound is healed. At the beginning of the last three and a half years of his reign he breaks his peace treaty with the Jews and moves his headquarters from Rome to Jerusalem and sits in the rebuilt Jerusalem temple claiming to be God and demanding the worship of the world. He builds a gigantic image of himself and commands everyone to worship on pain of death. The Jews and unsaved Christians who are left behind after the rapture are persecuted mercilessly. Finally after seven years pass a glorious individual appears in different parts of the earth with a radiance that outshines the noonday sun. He heals the diseases of the people, speaks in soft subdued tones some of the truths that Jesus spoke, and destroys the Antichrist as the enemies of the Jews and the Christians who were left behind, and the enemies of the Jews and Christians who were left behind. I can just hear Christians say at that time, we told you Seventh-day Adventists that things were going to develop in this way, but you would not listen. Now you see that we were right and you were wrong. The question is folks, how many people in the world at that time would believe the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy? How many would believe that the true enemies of God's people are the Roman Catholic Papacy, apostate Protestantism, allied with the kings of the whole world and the multitudes of the whole world? The answer is that there would be very few, only the elect, who would be willing to hold on to the traditional view that is provided by the historicist method of interpreting Bible prophecy. Now somebody might say, Pastor Boyd, you're somewhat insane. What makes you think that Satan will be able to implement the prophetic scenario that is taught by futurism? I'm not categorically saying that it will happen this way, but when we remember that when the door of probation closes, Satan will have full and complete control of the impenitent, it might just happen that way. Why would the devil have this scenario preached every Sunday morning on television if he did not have an agenda in mind for the future? God will withdraw his spirit. Satan will be allowed full reign to carry out his program except he will not be allowed to kill God's people. Ellen White says in Great Controversy, page 614, that when probation closes, the restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed and Satan has entire control of the finally impenitent. And believe me, if the devil is able to make an airplane disappear, he would not have much trouble making people disappear as well. Is it not time, folks, that as Adventists we should give the trumpet a certain sound and warn the world about these things? who the dangerous powers are, what the issues in the final controversy are, and how to be on the Lord's side, and the fact that a time of trouble is coming such as never has been seen, and we need to prepare a character that is fit to go through that period of human history and receive Jesus when he comes in glory. I believe that we have a special prophetic message for the world for now, because we see things happening in the world where things are winding down to the end. I'm not giving dates, I'm not saying that he's coming tomorrow or next week or even in a year or two, but the signs in the world indicate that prophecy is fulfilling the way that it is depicted in Daniel Revelation and in the book The Great Controversy. You see Satan not only hates our message, he hates our method, because our message is based on our method. If you get rid of historicism, you get rid of our message. And if you get rid of our message, you get rid of our mission. You've probably read the book, Futurism's Incredible Journey. There it's portrayed in a simple way, the devastating effects of futurism on the message of the Adventist church. You see, we believe that we can observe the simple trajectory of prophecy and we can identify the Antichrist by looking at the flow of prophetic history. We believe that there are no gaps. It's a simple method that even children can understand. 
The historical flow method helps us understand who the Antichrist is, when and where he will arise, what he will do, who will help him recover his power. Historicism shows what the issues are in the conflict. Furthermore, it tells us when and where the remnant church would arise in the course of human history. It shows us what our message is, what our mission is. Those who reject this message crawl around in prophetic darkness. If the Antichrist is a literal future person, and the time periods of his dominion are literal and future, then the Roman Catholic Church has nothing to do with the fulfillment of prophecy. Protestantism as a fulfillment of prophecy disappears in a mist as well. Is that perhaps the reason why Protestants today are wanting to join the Roman Catholic Church? Because they've lost their prophetic bearings? Do you actually think that if Protestants today understood this scenario of Bible prophecy, which was sustained by the Protestant reformers that founded these Protestant churches, do you think that if they followed this prophetic method, they would want anything to do with the Roman Catholic papacy or with apostate Protestantism? They would come out and folks, the book of Revelation chapter, not, chapter 18 says that multitudes will come out of Babylon when this message is presented with power. Ellen White had this to say about those individuals who, who don't identify the Antichrist according to scriptural principles. This is found in the bo volume 7 of the Bible Commentary, page 949. She says, those who become confused in their understanding of the word, who fail to see the meaning of Antichrist will surely place themselves on the side of Antichrist. Is it important to know who the little horn is? Is it important to know who the beast is? Is it important to know what the image of the beast is? And the mark of the beast is? Yes, because the world needs to know folks. They need to make a decision for the Lord. And if they don't know who the anti, if they're looking for an Antichrist in the Middle East, they're looking in the wrong place. If they're expecting uh, uh, to be gone for the tribulation, they're not preparing a character fit for heaven and fit for the tribulation. And so folks, this is a matter of life and death. And so she continues saying, those who become confused in their understanding of the word, who fail to see the meaning of Antichrist, will surely place themselves on the side of Antichrist. And then notice this, there is no time now for us to assimilate with the world. Do you know when it is that we lose our conception of who the Antichrist is? When we what? When we assimilate with the world. She continues saying, Daniel is standing in his lot and in his place. The prophecies of Daniel and of John are to be understood. They interpret each other. They give to the world truths which everyone should understand. These prophecies are to be, a wit are to be witnesses in the world by their fulfillment in these last days, they will explain themselves. And yet even in the Seventh-day Adventist Church we have scholars, some of them teach in our religious institutions, who are saying that our views of Bible prophecy are mistaken. Let me refer to two specific individuals, and this is back in the 1990s, early 1990s, a history te teacher at La Sierra University in Southern California, teacher of Reformation studies. That's what's interesting. His teaching was on the Protestant Reformation. That was his strong suit. He said, well, the Roman Catholic Church of the past, and now I quote, was a contemptuous and contemptible organization. But then he goes on to say this, but those days are over. The world has changed, the United States has changed, and even the Roman Catholic Church has changed. In the second half of our century, having reconciled itself with progress, liberalism, and modern civilization, it, that is the Roman Catholic Papacy, is no longer the Bible-suppressing, science-resisting, liberty-opposing, Protestant-hating, culture-ignoring, Latin-mumbling, obscurantism-loving, ecclesiastical organization of former years, intent on ruling the world from Rome. So the papacy is not that anymore, he's saying. Vatican Council II transformed all of that. All the Vatican Council II did was give the Roman Catholic Church a facelift. 
and at last I knew that is cosmetic surgery. He continues saying, to ignore these new realities and to refuse to come to terms with the contemporary Roman church is to choose to remain stuck in a religious no man's land, condemning a church that no longer exists, using old labels and propaganda that only offend and alienate deeply. Instead, Seventh-day Adventists ought to involve themselves in building bridges of understanding, to reach out to Roman Catholics and developing bonds of love to enable them with us to arrive at a fuller appreciation and application of the gospel of Jesus Christ. History teacher, La Sierra University. Notice how Ellen White described it. This is found in the book Great Controversy, pages 571 and 572. And incidentally, this is the best description that I've ever found on what the papacy is. What Ellen White is going to give now. She says the papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of the latter times. It is part, a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. And here comes the description. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Cosmetic external change. You tell me one do dogma of the Roman Catholic Church that has been changed. Do they still believe that you're supposed to come to Jesus through Mary? Do they still believe that Jesus is sacrificed in math, in the Mass? Do they still believe in purgatory? Do they still believe in indulgences? Do they still believe that hell is going to burn forever? Do they still believe that Sunday is the day of worship? Do they still believe that you can bow to idols? So how has it changed? Who has changed? Protestants have changed. And that's why they differ less from, from Catholics. It's because, not because Catholicism has changed, but Protestantism has changed. So she says, Beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics, nor persons suspected of heresy, she declares. Shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of saints, be now acknowledged as a part of the Church of Christ? asked Ellen White. It is not without reason that the claim has been put forth in Protestant countries that Catholicism differs less widely from Protestantism than in former times. There has been a change, but the change is not in the papacy. Catholicism indeed resembles much of the Protestantism that now exists because Protestantism has so greatly degenerated since the days of the reformers. Is that a good description? That is a fitting description. And then Ellen White in Review and Herald June 1, 1886 said that the union between Catholics and Protestants will not however be effected by a change in Catholicism, for Rome never changes. She claims infallibility. It is Protestantism that will change. And then she says the adoption of liberal ideas, when Ellen White speaks about liberal ideas, she's talking about uh, uh, civil rights and human rights, she's talking about being politically correct. That's the terminology that we would use today. In other words, the adoption of political correctness or liberal ideas, false charity she also calls it, on its part, that is on the part of Protestantism, will bring it where it can clasp the hand of Catholicism. So who are we to believe? Paul Landa or Ellen White? No contest. There's another teacher at La Sierra University back in the early 90's by the name of Frank Canittle, I believe that he taught in the English department of the same university and uh, he's had some interesting things to say about Ellen White's book, The Great Controversy. And I quote, this is from Adventist Today, the July-August issue, 1993, page 11. He says, regarding the Great Controversy, we must not base our spiritual warning to the world on evidence which we feel is found in any book other than the Bible. White gave Adventism her interpretation of the scriptures, and her view is not infallible. He's pitting the Bible against Ellen White. 
and listen carefully. He says that, that the view that the papacy is the Antichrist was the view of Ellen White. So let me ask you, how did the reformers get their view that the papacy was the Antichrist? They didn't have Ellen White. They studied scripture and they reached the same conclusions as Ellen White from the Bible. So, so to say that, oh you can't trust Ellen White what she says about the papacy, because that's her, the fact is that Protestantism has gone astray from its roots. If Martin Luther resurrected from the dead today, he would die of a heart attack, <laughs> because he would not recognize the Lutheran church. If John Calvin resurrected today, he would not believe what was before his eyes, because the Presbyterian church would not be the church that he knew. Blessing gay marriage and with gay clergy. These reformers, they fought for the Bible with their lives. And what they had to fight for with their lives is being destroyed by a group of individuals who no longer believe in the inspiration of the scriptures. Tanil continued saying, Our message to the world, as Paul declared, for himself is Jesus Christ and him crucified and a detailed accounting of the prophecies and an exposition of the Sabbath is secondary. That sound like an Adventist? Whatever we wish to believe about prophecy is our own right and responsibility. But whatever we believe should be based totally upon what we derive from our own study of the Bible and not upon anything written by anyone since the canon of the scriptures was established. I would say unless what that person wrote is in harmony with scripture. He continues saying we have almost destroyed ourselves by our passionate disinclination to search for ourselves and we wear out the pages of the Ellen G. White Index when we should instead be studying the Bible. Basically what he's saying is study the Bible, discard Ellen White, but eventually what happens is people study the Bible, if they studied the Bible the way they're supposed to, they would reach the same conclusions as Ellen White concerning Bible prophecy. So Canidal says we need to preach the gospel, we need to preach the true gospel, and he mentions the first angel's message. What he doesn't tell you is that the first angel's message is not only Revelation 14 verse 6. You know, people like to quote Revelation 14 verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell in the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and they stop there. But folks, the three, the, the, the three angels' messages continue. The first angel not only preaches the everlasting gospel, he says, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour his judgment is come, and worship him. And then it appeals to the Creator, which is the Sabbath. So Canidal says the Sabbath is secondary. Folks, it's part of the same message where the angel is preaching the everlasting gospel. And by the way, part of the message is also calling people out of Babylon. That's the second message. And the third message says, beware of receiving the mark of the beast. Rather than that, receive the seal of God. Why does he stop at verse 6? Why not continue the three angels' messages like Ellen White so eloquently does in her writings? Is it any surprise to us that Billy Graham called the Pope, Pope John Paul II, the world's foremost moral leader? Is it shocking that the late Paul Crouch, the founder of, th of TVN, would say, I'm not protesting anything, I'm deleting the word Protestant from my vocabulary? Is it a surprise that Robert Schuller, who established the Crystal Cathedral, would say that he hopes that the day will come when the entire Christian world will accept the Pope as its leader? Is it any surprise that Jack Van Impe, as he looked at John Paul II, would with admiration say, what a man? Is it any surprise that Lutherans and Catholics signed a joint declaration on righteousness by faith? Is it any surprise that prominent Protestant and Catholic leaders signed the document Evangelicals and Catholics together where basically they said that they agreed on the common points? The question is, are the common points at issue at the end of time? Is that present truth in the end time? No. 
the issues have to do with where Jesus is. Where is Jesus? In the most holy place. So wherever Jesus is, that is present truth. If you want to know what present truth is, what we should be preaching, we should find out, find out where Jesus is and what Jesus is doing and preach that. And that would involve, of course, preaching that the heavenly sanctuary is being cleansed. And therefore, in parallel fa fashion, we should be cleansing the temple of our soul. It involves preaching that God's law is still binding. It involves preaching that the Sabbath is still God's day of rest. It involves preaching health reform. It involves preaching that the hour of God's judgment is here. In other words, it involves preaching a whole cluster or a whole system of truth that is centered in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Why does the religious world reject the Seventh-day Adventist message? Folks, it's simple. They have refused to enter the most holy place to discover the truths that are centered there. It's that simple. And I have a book that's called Worship at Satan's Throne. It's an analysis of the message to the Church of Philadelphia. And I analyze also Ellen White's throne vision where she's commenting on the message to Philadelphia. On what happened with the Protestant world when the Protestant world rejected the message of the Millerites. You know, probation closed for, for the Roman Catholic system in 1798. Probation closed for Protestantism. I'm not talking about individuals within the Catholic Church or individuals within the different Protestant churches. No, I'm not talking about that. There are sincere loving Christians in all churches. The Roman Catholic Church, Protestant churches, even among non-Christians, there are people who serve God to the best of their knowledge. I'm talking about systems. In 1844, when the Protestant churches disfellowshipped Ellen White and her family and cast those who were preaching the message of the second coming out of their churches. The second branch of Babylon fell, which is the daughters. And so Protestantism and Roman Catholicism are fallen systems. Why do you suppose God would tell us to preach in, from Revelation chapter 18, come out of her my people? Is it any surprise to us that people like Ralph Reed and Pat Robertson and others would try to unite Catholics and Protestants in voting blocks to get certain can candidates elected to office. Candidates that are in harmony with their worldview and their scenario. Folks, as Adventists we need to recover our prophetic roots. We need to get back to the basics. We need to get back to preaching present truth. It has power to bring conviction to people. I've seen it. Taj has seen it in his meetings. Uh, I never cease to marvel, you know, when he's come to our church twice, the way people respond. And he doesn't water down the message. I mean, it's direct, everything, including jewelry and health reform and you name it. It's all there. And multitudes of people give their hearts to the Lord. So this idea that if you preach prophecy, if you preach doctrine, you know, people are going are to get scared and they're not going to want to come, that's not true. When it's presented in a beautiful way, in a way that it makes sense, people embrace it and they're excited about becoming Seventh-day Adventists. I want to finish by mentioning the loud cry of Revelation 18. You know what the loud cry is? It's when the messages of the three angels are given a boost. God will put jumper cables if you please, on the three angels' messages. And they will be proclaimed with the utmost power. What does the message of Revelation 18 say? It says Babylon is fallen, and she has become the habitation of demons. And it says, you better get out of there, because plagues are going to fall upon her. Come out of her, my people, so that you do not partake in her sins, and you do not receive her plagues. I end this session by reading from Great Controversy 606 and 607 about what Ellen White says concerning this loud cry. It's very inspiring. This is Great Controversy 606 and 607. She says, Thus the message of the third angel will be proclaimed. As the time comes for it to be given with the greatest power, the Lord will work through humble instruments 
leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. No PhD needed. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is needed. I'm not saying that education is bad, don't get me wrong, education can be good as long as education is in harmony with the philosophy and beliefs of the Adventist church and helps the church to fulfill its mission. But God is not dependent upon great knowledge gained in literary institutions. She continues saying, men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. Who's going to unmask these things? The Holy Spirit through humble instruments. She says, by these solemn war warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. In amazement, they hear the testimony that Babylon is the church, fallen because of her errors and sins, because of her rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. As the people go to their former teachers with the eager inquiry, are these things so? The ministers present fables, prophesy smooth things, to soothe the fears and quiet the awakened conscience. But since many refuse to be satisfied with the mere authority of men, and demand a thus saith the Lord, the popular ministry, like the Pharisees of old, filled with anger as their authority is questioned, will denounce the message as of Satan, and stir up the sin-loving multitudes to revile and persecute those who proclaim it. That is what is ahead for the humble instruments that God is going to use to finish his work on this earth, to let everybody know what the issues are and what powers are involved in the final controversy. So I hope that we've been able to understand how important the historical flow method is. Have you, have you grasped that our historical flow method is vital? Without it there is no Seventh-day Adventist church and it comes from within scripture. It is not imposed on scripture.